My dad, Herbert Palin, who most people call Poppy, was born in Lancashire in 1932. You can see him here as a youngster. Circumstances turned against him even before he was born because his dad, Bertie Palin, seen here with Granny Jones, died while Granny Jones was pregnant with Poppy. So he was born without a dad. It was actually a bit worse than that, especially for Poppy's mum. I'll let Poppy explain a bit more. As she was giving birth to me, a few short months earlier, her husband had died. She'd had two daughters. They had both died. So she was alone in childbirth, also responsible for her youngest sister who was an orphan. So it was a pretty rocky start for sure and they were on a slippery slope to abject poverty. If my mother hadn't met my stepfather that we were bound for the workhouse, uh, anybody who's ever seen Oliver and the Dickens times, that's where when you were completely there was no welfare state in the 1930s that had not been introduced. So when you ran out of money and, and an ability to care for yourself, you had to go into this institution. But Granny Jones is the great survivor. And as Poppy mentioned, she eventually marries Bob Jones, who brings his own kids into the frame with all of the challenges that that entails. But Poppy makes it through to year eight and gets a job. The work ethic clearly started from a very early age. Well, I left school at uh, 14 and uh, I went to work as a telegraph messenger in uh, the post office. But he was soon pretty restless and, as he says in his own notes on the topic, he buggered off into the Royal Navy. War then breaks out in Korea and all of a sudden he's in active service. Time Navy, they're, they're training you all the time and you, you, you're doing the things that you would do if, 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 if it was ever required. And now eventually, there I was doing what I was, what I was trained to do and it was, it was hard work and it was stimulating and it was, uh, yeah, it was good. Poppy and I would later come to joke over a beer that just about the safest place to be during the Korean War was bobbing around in the Sea of Japan on a British aircraft carrier, given the enemy didn't even have a navy at the time. But come on, active service is active service. So he returns from the navy and a lot of his mates have moved on. He goes to the movie by himself and he meets a woman. Spoiler alert, she eventually ends up to be our mum. So I went to pictures by myself and went to the movies. And uh, come back little Sheba was the film. I was coming out and uh, I saw this girl I, 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 I half remembered, you know, and I said, didn't you used to uh, work on this? Yeah. And uh, she was with her cousin, Maureen, who was still in contact with. So we got talking and, and uh, I asked her for a date. And it just went from there. They eventually get married while Poppy is on leave from the Navy. The nuptials are a bit on again, off again, but eventually it's all good. But he gets restless back in the UK. He's had a stint as a fireman, but then he keeps seeing these posters pop up all over St. Helens and they trigger an idea in Poppy about a better life, a warmer climate and an adventure. And perhaps above all, more opportunities for his children. So largely on the strength of these posters, Poppy puts his plan into action. We set off for Australia and we land in Sydney on April Fool's Day 1964. A rather worrying omen. Poppy told me later he looked out over the wasteland behind East Hills Immigrant Hostel, having been half eaten to death by mosquitoes on the first night and he muttered to himself, what the hell? have I done. But things do get better. Mum and Dad eventually buy our first family home in Fairfield. We've got a backyard, a car
carport, a swing, and Granny Jones comes to visit. Reggie arrives on the scene, and life is good. Ooh, I can't live without you, you butterfly. I knew from the first time I kissed you that you were the trouble and kind. But we're still an English family trying to learn how to live in Australia. One thing that Poppy learns to love is his portable barbecue. We take that thing everywhere to Warragamba Dam, Bronte Beach, and Centennial Park. He and I even take it to the SCG one day to watch New South Wales versus Victoria in a Sheffield Shield game, and Poppy starts cooking his sausages on the hill. When I look up, there's about 10 blokes lined up who think Poppy is the sausage sandwich man at lunchtime. I have to usher them all away, explaining that all the sausages are only for us. My memory is that we all grow up thinking that Poppy knows everything. You know that thing where you just can't believe that your own dad knows the answer to every question about history, politics and life. And I learnt out later, of course, it wasn't because of how far he made it in school, it was because he was a reader. He set a great role model in showing us all the importance of education through reading. He was also a great role model in the way he treated the women around him. Loved his wife forever, visited mum almost every day in the nursing home until she died, and Poppy absolutely adored his own mother. But I don't want everyone to think Poppy was a saint. He had his tough side as well, and he had values. Like the time he made Steve-O ride back to get his football boots at Adams Park on a cold, rainy winter's night after Steve had left them at training, only for Steve then to get hit by a tow truck while riding his bike and ending up in Fairfield Hospital. Poppy actually was unapologetic, and to be fair, Pales did survive. Poppy was in equal parts funny and entertaining. That was true right up to the final period of his life in the nursing home. When Poppy signed up for the Navy, they asked him if he could swim, and he quipped, why, haven't you got any boats? Air India later lost Poppy's bags on the way to the UK on one of their big trips, and when he was checking in to come home, he asked them to send one bag to the USA and one bag to New Zealand. And when the check-in guy said they couldn't do that, Poppy replied, well, you did it the last time I flew with you. He loved to sing, and as has been pointed out elsewhere, he didn't need much encouragement. Karaoke was his thing, and he was entertaining crowds and getting standing ovations well into his 90s. He could dance too. We loved having a dad that our relatives liked and our friends liked. He'd take us to the footy at Belmore or on a boat trip or to Bado Bay to snorkel and we'd always have friends and neighbours tagging along. People loved that he was a bit different and a bit naughty. He spent Christmas Eve two years ago, chatting up Gab's mum and then getting into trouble on returning to his place, which Anne was looking after. Well, well, well. I didn't realise you were going to be here. And what time of the <laughs> night do you call this young man? <laughs> it's way past midnight. Oh, shut up. <laughs> I've been a good boy. You are grounded. He was loved by Steve-O, Reggie and I, of course, and adored by his grandchildren. So while Poppy might have had a rocky start, his plan all came together in the end. His legacy is a happy, educated, curious, functional network of offspring and grandchildren, all leading productive, stimulating, travel-filled lives. And that's exactly what he would have hoped for when his plan developed 
after seeing those posters in St Helens. So here's to a life well lived Poppy, and please, rest in peace my man, because the plan all worked out in the end. I wanna hold on.